Tree Overpass Project, Discussion on the Economic Impact Study and the Elden Loop Road Connection. Ms. Cameron. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Christine Cameron. I'm a project manager with City Capital Improvements. So we've got two items that we want to talk to you tonight about the Lone Tree Overpass. One of them is the Economic Impact Study and also the Elden Loop Corridor. So the Economic Impact Study was, um, it was previous Mayor and Council directed staff to perform that study. Um, you know, this was rolled into WSP's design and their economic group uh, conducted that. So Jason Karloftis with WSP will go over that information tonight. And also the Eldon Loop. Um, this is a connector roadway that was part of the 2010 engineering study and also included in the 2018 uh, bond proposition language, in the pamphlet language, excuse me. Um, we've heard from property owners in the neighborhood uh, that they want access. Um, they, they don't want the overpass to cut, cut the industrial area in two where they can't get from one side to the other. Uh, we've also heard from the south side community that they don't want additional traffic coming into their neighborhood um, and they don't want truck traffic coming into their neighborhood from this, over, or from this connector. Um, so those are the two uh, that we'll be covering tonight, the two topics. We will need council's direction on the Eldon Loop um, corridor. And um, I'll turn it over to Jason now. He's with our design team of WSP in Ames Construction, and uh, he is the design lead. We also have, <coughs> excuse me, Jeff Bauman, our traffic engineer, and Julie Lead from Peak Engineering with us. So, thank you. Thank you. Even a mayor, vice mayor, council members, pleasure to be here back in front of you guys, <coughs> or in front of everybody this evening. Happy to present our uh, update on the economic impact study and the Eldon Corridor. And thank you, Christine, for in the introduction. Um, also online, I do have Chris Kane, the project manager for Ames Construction, and our economist, Sophie Cohen, as well as our roadway lead, uh, Frank Fry, and our traffic lead, Joseph Vaskovic. So if there's any uh, questions, I may throw it to them that if I can't answer them. So I appreciate them being online as well this evening. Um, so just to start, uh, Christine covered what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, we will start with the economic impact study, and then we'll go with the uh, Elden Corridor, and then talk about some some options, if it does stay, that we can try to do what's called street calming, to try to discourage some pass-through traffic and truck traffic through the corridor. So that's another option we can consider. So we'll try to give some multiple options of uh, keeping the street, if it or if it's removed, or we can keep it with some modifications, some mitigation measures. So that's sort of what we'll cover this evening. Um, so starting with economics, I want to sort of just give the background of, of what caused this study. Um, the the big change of of this street network is the changes in traffic patterns. So we want to evaluate how that would affect the impacts of the economics in the area. Our approach to our study. Um, the impacts, and then we were asked to also evaluate the gentrification uh, focused on the south side neighborhood. So we did evaluate, we, had that, we added that to our EIS, so if I use the term EIS, that's the economic impact study. Um, that's just the shorthand we use. Um, but we'll cover the gentrification that we did add to that study towards the end of our study. Um, so you guys have seen this uh, graphic quite a bit, uh, quite a few times. Um, let me change this to laser pointer real quick. Um, so this is from our larger six-lane model. When I use the term six-lane model, it does not mean Lone Tree is a six-lane roadway. It's just from our larger model, we had capacity from our original TIA to have large enough volumes at the intersections to, capa to have enough capacity at the intersections where it behaved as a six-lane model. So at no time has Lone Tree ever been a six-lane roadway. Just want to clarify that. Um, we did stick with this model for our EIS because it was a more conservative approach. It had the larger change in traffic patterns compared to the new four-lane model that we'll, we'll be presenting in a few weeks to you with the intersection updates. So because this had the larger change in impacts, we wanted to keep this as a conservative approach from an economic impact. Um, from this model that we presented back to you back in January, you can see the biggest changes are on Beaver in San Francisco. There's about a 70% reduction on these roadways. Um, generally, we also pulled traffic from the Milton Route 66 corridor up in the northwest of this figure down to Butler Avenue. So those are the other big trends. We're pulling traffic from what stays currently on Milton Route 66 down to Butler. Lone Tree itself becomes a, a major north-south corridor. 
And then once you get east of Lone Tree, traffic returns back to Route 66 and then heads east. So the black numbers are the build condition for when Lone Tree is in and constructed. Red is uh, previous before Lone Tree. So that's the no build condition. Um, so east-west on Route 66, there is about a 25% increase in traffic east of Lone Tree, about a 25% reduction west of Lone Tree, and then at Butler and Lone Tree, there's about a 25% increase. So you're just generally seeing a shift in traffic from the northwest quadrant, the downtown area, uh, to the southeast Lone Tree Butler area. So that's the general traffic conditions. Um, our study did focus on traffic because that's the best data we have. Um, we didn't focus too much on multimodal uh, shifts. We have a lot less refined data. We didn't want to make guesses and try to make assumptions on, on really loose data. Um, so we did not try to make uh, guesses on impacts to bicycle movements or pedestrian traffic. So that has not been included in this study. Now we can make some assumptions and some general trend mm -hmm. guesses. Um, okay, oh, sorry about that. Um, but, so this will be focused mainly on the traffic trends. Um, so as I stated before, San Francisco Beaver will have a reduction, Butler Lone Tree area uh, will have an increase in vehicles, and Milton and Route 66 has that split between the east-west sides of Lone Tree overall. Um, so spending impacts themselves, when we get into an EIS, we really focus on two types of spending. We focus on opportunity spending, so this is as you're driving by a business, you have a pass-by opportunity to spend, so it's, you're going to morning you're going to work in the morning, you need coffee, you happen to be passing by a coffee shop. You have an opportunity to pass by, stop for coffee. So these businesses that are located on the street and you're passing on your route to traffic, that's your opportunity dollars being spent. You also have destination sales. You're meeting friends after work for drinks. You're going to your favorite diner for pizza or burger. Those are destination. You're going there regardless of what route or what traffic trends are telling you to go. That's destination. Destination is a lot less impacted by your street network. You're going to go there regardless of what the traffic trends are going because you have an intention to go there. Um, so the shift in traffic is not going to really impact your destination traffic. It's only going to impact your opportunity. Other opportunity traffics might be like grocery stores. If you're going home and you need to pick up food for the kids, you're going to go to the grocery store on your way home. That's on your natural route from traffic. So if you put those types of concepts, that's really what we tried to break down our traffic, our, our types of commercial districts. Hotel lodging is probably not going to be impacted by too much, uh, but you're really looking for those keystone. What are your pass-by traffics where you're stopping in on your route to and from work? Those are going to be your biggest impacts in your corridors. Um, I do want to back up real quick. We did break up our zones into two big areas. We did try to focus on the downtown commercial districts, and then we have the big commercial district at Lone Tree and Butler. We do have some commercial districts we recognize along Route 66 east of Lone Tree, but it's not very high density, so we didn't do a big focus on that, that part of the commercial district just because it wasn't high density. So I, don't, I do want to point that out. <clears throat> we also looked at spending per trip. This was done using Bureau of Labor Statistics. So when, you, when I uh, get into some dollars, that's, that's where it's based on. Um, you know, we'll get into more... Uh, definition of that, but we did use a composite of similar regional markets. The Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics does not have defined data for Flagstaff itself. So the approach we took was to find similar regional data. It was a blend of Phoenix and Denver primarily, and then we adjusted it for demographic data. So we tried to get as close to the Flagstaff dem demography as we could. So that's the approach we took for getting our, our numbers that you'll see later. So in general, we looked at both the opening year, the closing year, and then you'll see an average over that span. Um, so when we did our traffic modeling, we do the opening year of 2026, and then we do a horizon year. All the, the traffic data is based on Metro Plan's modeling. Um, so they do have assumptions on vehicular growth, as I explained previously back in January. And these numbers are presenting the average annual change in automobile trips in each commercial district. So this is just the change in automobile stops or passerbys through the districts. So you, again, over the average annual trips through Beaver, San Francisco districts, you're gonna get about a half million less cars going through there on their normal commute. Butler Lone Tree, you're getting an increase of about a quarter million 
the opening year, and then as you get your normal growth in vehicular traffic, it increases to about a half million. The reason Butler and Lone Tree don't balance with Beaver and San Francisco at 2026 is because you get that north-south connection of Lone Tree, and then they head east on Route 66. By the time you get to 2040 horizon year, they start balancing out. So that's why you're seeing that discrepancy there. So now we get into the spending impacts, and this sort of breaks it down by business type, because going back to the opportunity and destination concepts, different types get different impacts. And what we see here, in these two areas, in these two districts we looked at, your biggest um, business types are business retail and food services and, and drinking places. So these are your two big, biggest business types in these commercial districts. Uh, they represent almost 80%, um, 90% of the Beaver San Francisco district. And they're roughly about the same in Lone Tree Butler district. So those, those are your primary. So a lot of these are gonna be, you know, if you're meeting with friends and stuff, a lot of these are gonna be destination, the food services and drinking places. But you will also get some opportunity if you're going home and picking up food for your kids on the way home. So we had to try to balance that with our, with our economics folks. Uh, business retail, we had to make a, it's a little bit harder to find because business retail is a pretty broad category. So our economists made the best decisions they could in balancing that category between the opportunity and destination. Based on the change of ADT, uh, they broke out the output economic impact. So this is the, the impacts of the change in traffic. So the output of dollars, uh, the, they resolve it into sort of an impact of equivalent employment in the district and the earnings overall in the district. So these are sort of broken out numbers. So I'll focus on the 2026 year um, primarily and then you can see the rest of the numbers. But you see the Beaver San Francisco district is anticipated to have generally for the entire district, again this isn't a singular business, this is the entire district overall about a loss of $380,000 of output reduction just based on traffic. It's an equivalent of about four less employees in the entire district and about 120,000 less in earnings. It's offset by an increase in the Butler Lone Tree District of 167,000 increase in output, an employment increase of about two employees and earnings increase of 50,000. So the overall net effect in the opening year will be a reduction in Employment of about two staff, an output of about $200,000, and earnings of about $70,000. So again, this is just based on traffic. And then put it into the larger scheme of Flagstaff overall. Flagstaff employs 72,000 workers citywide. And we're projecting about a two-staff uh, change. Um, just to point out again, um, this is fairly conservative. We're looking at just the ADT impacts. We're not evaluating the impacts of increased workers due to construction. We're not looking at multimodal shifts. Um, we wanted to be as conservative as possible in this analysis. Try to get just on the traffic shifts. Just want to refocus that. Um, we were also, uh, so the summary of, of this output, um, we did have because of the general shift and because we are sending some people up northeast, and again, we didn't include that either just because of the low density and the types of businesses up there, we do expect an annual net change of a loss of 1.6 jobs from this project in these two sectors. Um, this isn't a, to say the city will have a, a net loss, just these two districts will have a net change of a 1.6 staff reduction. So it's, it's the spending dollars will be shifted elsewhere outside of this these two districts if it's not offset elsewhere. Um, we do think the trend wise, because there's especially that drop in traffic on Beaver and San Francisco, there's an opportunity to increase walkability and ped bike traffic along those corridors. A lot of those businesses already are very walkable type businesses. They're, they're bars, they're eateries. They're places you can go hang out and go to multiple places that you likely would see an increase. Um, we do not want to make those guesses and those projections, though, so we do think there will be a natural shift um, just with the business types that there will be an encouragement to have some of that offset naturally. Um, we also do not account for productivity and, and improvements in travel times. So as we've previously shown in um, January, we do believe this network improvement will increase travel times for commuters. This does provide another grade separation for the city of Flagstaff, which should help people travel the downtown area, reduce congestion on Milton especially, 
and we'll let people get to and from their businesses early, or easier, uh, maybe encourage people to make an additional trip if needed to go see a business, and so there may be some offset just naturally by people being able to, to have less congestion on the streets. That was not included in this analysis because again, that's a grayer area, a little bit more difficult <coughs> for economists to, to project. Um, so mitigation strategies, how do we offset this change? Um, we've already talked a little bit about the natural adjustment. That's probably the most uh, likely scenario of how it'll naturally offset. You'll get more business types. Um, especially if we have the multimodal district, you're gonna get more of an entertainment district that's gonna be encouraged bicyclists and multimodal users using one district. You might get more vehicle dependent users in another district. That just might be the natural mitigation patterns and businesses will adjust to the natural patterns that come from this type of project. Uh, if the city were to designate bike port, uh, corridors, Beaver in San Francisco, that might help uh, accelerate that type of shift in traffic, especially if we are seeing those types of reductions that our models are predicting. Um, we'll also be taking this uh, information to the public at our public meetings and soliciting uh, additional ideas uh, of what we might see or what, what some public input might be on expectations from this type of project. There might be some other ideas if we're seeing these shifts in travel the public's agreeing that, yeah, well, if I have this route, I might be taken this way and, and see these shifts. So there might be some good ideas for the public of what we might expect to see from the public and actual users. So we're doing our best to model stuff, but when we get the actual public involved and see the actual behavior change, that's, that's when we can see our best mitigation measures. So with that, we'd like, I'd like to shift to gentrification risks. This was a special request from council. Um, back, I believe, when we presented in October. <clears throat> so this was focused on the South Side neighborhood and the, the changing gentrification in, in that specific community. Um, so our economists did evaluate <clears throat> several different trends that we are seeing. Um, we did look at both national trends, local demographic trends, and we did have a, a meeting with Dr. Guthrie with NAU and Ms. Deb Harris to talk about local trends from a, a local level of people who are in the community, know the community, know the trends, understand what's going on, to really get a, a local understanding of what's going on. Provided really good, valuable insight for our experts. Um, in general, the displacement they're seeing, well, let me step back and define gentrification. So gentrification is the displacement of existing re uh, residents or certain demographics over the long run. It's typically caused by, you know, a demand for housing exceeding supply, growth in housing costs, or a change in the, the cultural identity of a community, typically driven by income and wealth. So that's generally what the major drivers for gentrification are. It can lead to a change in community culture and character, and it's, uh, you know, it changes really the social and built-in environment. Um, it can be rapid, it can be slow, and generally when you do have redevelopment, it can tend to accelerate some of these trends uh, that go into these neighborhoods. Um, so like I said, we did reach out to Dr. Guthrie and, and Ms. Ms. Harris and to get a better understanding. And we did identify several general trends that, we, that as a group we identified as major drivers. And then we tried to evaluate how does Lone Tree itself impact these drivers? Or is it aiding it? Is it mitigating it? Is it a no impact? Driver. So as a group, these are sort of the key risks that we identified. Um, the fourth is NEU's growth and expansion. You know, there's a high demand for student housing. I think we've all recognized that, and it's expanding into this community, the Southside neighborhood as well. Um, so how does Lone Tree Overpass contribute to this? Um, our thoughts and, you know, our economists felt it, it may help mitigate it by improving a network uh, mobility. We're providing an alternate path and entryway through the downtown area and adjacent to NAU. Improved travel times. It gives the students an opportunity to live uh, maybe a little further away from campus and still make it to class on time. If we have changes to the San Francisco and Beaver and have those bike corridors and connectivity with the Foots Trail, which is a very key part of the project, have those connections built in especially if the Foots Trail extends north and then east-west, where some plans are moving forward, you give students uh, other options to be able to connect to the, to the campus and the community. So we see this as a potential mitigation with the project and other projects that the city's working on long-term. 
Uh, another uh, general risk item is the climate migration and short-term rentals, second homes. These are the Airbnbs and, and other elements where people are buying second homes, renting them out. Um, so short-term rentals, non-permanent residents. Um, this is a medium risk for sure in this community. We're already starting to see people move in and, and out of town, people moving in and buying houses. And this is a desirable neighborhood. There's a very walkable uh, entertainment district right nearby. Um, so how does Lone Tree impact this? It does improve access to the south side neighborhood, so we do see it as a potential, um, f it potentially facilitates the risk. So we do, because it does, again, provide access to the area. It does encourage people to potentially move into the neighborhood. The Rio de Flag flood control project. This is a pretty critical project for the city. A uh, major element of that is it will remove quite a big part of this neighborhood from the, the flood, flood maps. So it's gonna make the property more valuable. It's a pretty big project, pretty important project. Uh, Lone Tree, while it's working hand in hand, um, it's no direct impact. We are working directly with the Rio de Flag project. That project hopefully is gonna occur with or without the Lone Tree project, and so we don't see it as a direct impact. Um, the attractive neighborhood character. This is a very centrally located neighborhood. It's a high desirable neighborhood, so it's, it's a medium impact overall, it's a medium risk overall. Um, Lone Tree, and that's something we'll talk about <laughs> later on, it may or may not uh, cause cut through traffic, which may or may not improve uh, the livability. So it's sort of one of those um, contributions that's a little harder for us to judge. It could contribute, it could not contribute. Um, the intent of Lone Tree is to provide an alternate access route to really discourage the cut through traffic by improving the network. That's our goal of Lone Tree, is to provide a north-south network that has a grade separation with BNSF. And hopefully that's what uh, commuters will use instead of cutting through the neighborhood. That's really one of our goals of the project. Uh, demand for parking. Um, this is a mixed risk. As we develop, as if, if there's some high density especially, or mixed density reuses and redevelopment, then you have an increased uh, demand for parking, and that then spurs additional redevelopment. Um, so we see that as potential risk mitigation. This is a mixed you know, neighborhood with industrial uses. So there's definitely a chance for some redevelopment to, going, to go on. A low tree we see as a general low impact. Um, we are providing in, improved network mobility for vehicles, so it will potentially spur on some redevelopment in the area. We recognize that and see low tree as a potential co contributor to that. And then uh, finally into redevelopment itself, it's a medium risk for south side with changes to the neighborhood character by driving that uh, redevelopment we mentioned. So Lone Tree providing that extra access is gonna involve potentially some redevelopment or some potential redevelopment in the neighborhood. So it is a contributor to that. Overall, we identified three major uh, summary points for gentrification, and this was part of our EIS, is that overall we consider Lone Tree a low impact gentrification. The trends are already in place. Um, there are some items where Lone Tree will help accelerate some of these trends. There's also some trends that it helps uh, mitigate and, and hinder a little bit. Um, so there's some positives and minuses from Lone Tree itself towards gentrification, but the risks are, un the underlying risks are already there. Um, it's already at a medium, medium high risk due to the desirable location and the general trends, as we mentioned. And the area drivers are really the largest risk for gentrification with the proximity to NAU and downtown being the biggest drivers. So that's, that's where we came from, that's what we submitted to the city in our report. Um, so that sort of completes the EIS section. Um, I'm happy to pause here before we move on to Eldon if, if needed or we can keep going forward. Any questions, uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you and thank you for being here tonight. I'm wondering if we have done any outreach specifically to the businesses in on the Beaver San Francisco corridor area. We have not done any specific business outreach. Um, we've limited it to a small group discussion with Dr. Guthrie, um, Ms. Harris, um, experts who really understand the trends of the, the demographics. As a business owner downtown, I'm not in that area, but I would want to know that this is coming. I would maybe want to change my business model. Uh, hopefully the pedestrian bike traffic will even itself out pretty quick, but I, depending on what type of business it is, they may want to have that notice to kind of think, okay, I'm, 
you know, the car won't be driving by. Now I have a pedestrian or a bike. What can I do to capture that? So that we do some outreach yeah, soon. <laughs> Our intent is to present this at the next public meeting, which is tentative for some time in July, August. Um, we wanted to be able to present this to mayor and council first. Um, so that is part of our plan, and we are gonna solicit feedback from the community as well. It's part of an education, and then a solicit for feedback campaign. Thank you, any other questions? Council Member House. Thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering if you can further explain um, under the mitigation measures that you mentioned, um, the, the presentation of natural adjustments and business types. Because um, it was a little confusing to me as it, it sounded like a suggestion of, well, the businesses can just change um, to, to mitigate some of these concerns, which also sounds like instability then to the economic structure of that neighborhood or that area. Um, so can you go into that and, and just explain that a little bit more? Yeah, um, so I'll take a first shot then Sophie just to prepare you online. I may kick it to you as well. So it's, it's a natural adjustment we are talking about. It's not gonna be a project driven adjustment. It's going to be one that's reactive. Already in the downtown area, who's seeing the effect, these are mainly establishments that have, at least the ones we have identified and, and, and categorized, a lot of them are food and drink establishments, are uh, hotels, items like that are gonna be more your destination type businesses. So they're gonna have less of an impact overall. Um, there are some coffee shops and some other types of businesses that will see some opportunity drop. So it's, it's gonna be those types of businesses that might see some of the pass through traffic. Um, that will need to find a way to some offset. So it's whether finding a way to become more of a destination type business to draw people in, or finding a way to more coordinate or encourage the, the multimodal uptick that we think we'll see with the offset and reduction in traffic, especially on Beaver and San Francisco, where we might encourage more bicyclists and peds to use, um, and then cater more to those. Maybe it comes to something where we see maybe some outdoor dining patio experience or something to, to, to try, try, try to drive in those types of destination businesses. So it is a little bit of a combination of there might be some city efforts that could help, but there's also some business efforts that could also offset. So Sophie, I don't know if, you have, if you're online able to also add in. I'm here, I think you covered it well, Jason. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it, it does somewhat. I think I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards some of what the, the vice mayor just presented in, in terms of you know, recognizing that this wasn't necessarily presented to the, the businesses in the area. And I certainly appreciate the, the statement of outreach to uh, Ms. Harris and Dr. Guthrie, um, but neither of them are business owners in that area. They certainly have a wealth of knowledge of that area and I don't want to um, undervalue that. But because of this sort of economic impact that we're seeing in the shift and, and the impact to the businesses and the, the idea of them having to then shift their business models to accommodate this, it's concerning to me to not see them included in the conversation um, to talk more specifically about the impact to them, or at least give them that that heads up. Yeah, and I completely understand. That's why our next step is to include them in the public information part of this project. We do have two public meetings still scheduled. We are still doing public outreach, um, but our priority was first to get it in front of mayor and council to notify you all here tonight um, what our study was finding first, and then our public outreach was the next step as part of the project. I, oh, uh, Council Member Shimoni. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Jason and Christine and teams. Uh, good, good update. I, I really appreciate this presentation, Jason and Christine. I, this is some good data, and I, I really appreciate this insight. And, and Vice Mayor, I was thinking about you as I was preparing for today, thinking about what your comments might be about the business data that is being presented here in terms of the economic impact. And I, I, I definitely appreciate your comments and advocacy and, and Councilmember House, I'm right there with you too. 
Um, you know, this is kind of shows that levels of service are confusing, right? And A on Beaver maybe isn't always good for business, right? <laughs> but uh, F might be. But um, yeah, I'm just glad we're having this conversation. Jason, I appreciate you bringing this to us first. And I look forward to that community engagement. Definitely support you teaming up with the DBA and working with those side side businesses specifically. I appreciate you reaching out to uh, Deb and and um, Ricardo. That's that's wonderful. Um, and my comment really is just you know I love that we're talking about bike ped and, and multimodal uh, uptick in those in those areas, and that we want to encourage more. Um, and I'm just thinking you know what'd be really great. And I remember former deputy state manager Shane Dill always telling me, Adam, the opportunity here is to take Beaver and San Fran. And actually do something here as part of Lone Tree. And I was too focused on, on the number of lanes, right? But now that we're talking about this and the side effects, Jason, I guess my my seed that I'd like to plant with you to, to you know bring back to us when you come back to us is just the idea of how do we really embrace and encourage more cyclists and pedestrians given the change in driving patterns that we're expecting, you know? And, and I'm not just thinking about, you know, a thin strip of paint or green paint. I'm thinking about like that concerned but interested category of cyclists, which represents, I believe, 60 percent of the total population of Flagstaff. And uh, they really need separated infrastructure, whether there's a buffer or a little like, you know, those little flaps like we have, whatever it is. It might, it might, it might take a lane or it might take a parking lane, but uh, that'd be wonderful uh, that'd be really the icing on the cake with this project to me personally if we could also work forward a plan to you know better enhance those that infrastructure and mayor i know you've talked about this too and, and a lot of us have and and so just wanted to plant that seed um i think that's all i wanted to say yeah it is um and i look forward to the conversation and the rest of the presentation thank you thank you council member shimoni Thank you. I don't know if Terry from the DBA or anyone from Discover Flagstaff is on the line, but I do see this as an opportunity to really do some advertising for this corridor being bike ped friendly. Um, it could change kind of our message for um, for that area of downtown, and I think it's it's exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, is there anyone from the Discover Flagstaff team who might want to respond or um, online? Um, Mayor? Yeah. Um, Heidi Hansen, um, Interim Deputy City Manager. Definitely listening to the conversation and very happy to implement anything that you need. And I've written those notes down and I will share them with the team. Thank you. Excellent. All right. With that, I think we're good to uh, proceed. Thank you. Um, so our next topic is Eldon Corridor. Um, as Christine mentioned, we are trying to get to a decision whether Eldon Corridor moves forward or not as part of this project. So what we plan on doing tonight is <clears throat> review the concept, identify the concerns and the project impacts, um, discuss potential mitigation if the corridor stays, because we do understand the neighborhood's concerns and then ho hopefully request uh, that we identify a path forward for the project. And I'll explain why and what we're tied to uh, from a design concern. Um, so Ellen Corridor was incorporated as part of the project, as part of Prop 420. You can see it's this uh, green corridor. It does run from the west to the east side of the project underneath the grade separation of Lone Tree Road. So the bridge is in this blue area on the project, so it will run underneath the grade separation. <clears throat> it was originally identified in the 2010 uh, project assessment study, and then it was incorporated as part of the 420 plan. Um, was back in the 2010, it was, just pro it was intended to provide the east-west connection uh, between the two neighborhoods, because we are splitting the, the original neighborhood with the Lone Tree Road. Because we are elevated, this uh, majority of this section in red is going to be on retaining walls, providing a vertical barrier separation across the community and the industrial area. Um, we'll get into the Southside uh, community plan a little bit. Um, they have a little bit changes. Um, 
But as stated in 2010, it was conceived as a roadway only with no sidewalks. It was just to provide vehicular access. The 420 language adopted the roadway with the addition of the Foots Trail along the north edge of the, the, the roadway. Um, the Foots Trail was not part of the 420, but it was developed during the schematic design of this project to be included. So that would be a 10-foot path on the north side of the roadway with a five-foot sidewalk on the south side to provide sidewalks on both sides of the roadway. Um, to show you real quick, let me back out of here, conceptual look of what that would look like. Um, this is schematic only, so it's not intended to be final design, does not show the foots trail, for example, on the north side, but this is becoming underneath the grade separation starting on the east side, uh, looking west. We have about a 70-foot clearance from the abutment to where the Army Corps of Engineers right away is. The pathway would take up, well, the foots trail, roadway, and sidewalk would take up approximately 40 foot of that through this corridor, and then we would tie into um, the west side um, over in Ellen. So this is sort of just a fly through early from schematic. This has not been refined very much through design. So that's just sort of give you a conceptual uh, visualization of what it would look like. <clears throat> Going back to the presentation. So the Southside Community Plan, we did pull the exhibits from that plan just to show you what their concepts were. So they uh, did not have the continuation of Eldon Corridor from Eldon. Um, they instead had just uh, pathways, trail system, going underneath the project. And they had Lumber Street ending in a termination for uh, one of their concepts. They had two different concepts. So they utilized trails through this corridor area. And then their second concept, had a parking lot on the, the east side, and then a trail system as well with the concept of using uh, maybe a, a, multi, a sports court or basketball court underneath the bridge. So these are the figures that were developed during the Southside Community Plan, so we have a little bit of a discrepancy between what was passed in 420 and what the community plan that was adopted in uh, 2020 was. So that's why we're sort of here tonight, to see how we move forward. And the bridge as it's currently laid out does provide enough vertical clearance for providing something like a sports court. But as I stated, if we do provide the roadway and the foots trail that was shown in schematic, we only have about 70 feet between the bridge abutment and the Army Corps right away. It would take up about 40 feet of that zone. So we would not have as much space to provide some of these amenities in the Southside Community Plan. Um, but you can see neither of the Southside Community Plans provide the uh, vehicular access from the east and west sides either. It's just strictly uh, multimodal access, east and west. All right, so community benefits for the Eldon Corridor. It does provide access for properties east of Lone Tree to eastbound Butler Avenue. So the biggest challenge for the community, for the properties in this parcel, and there's about four, or in this quadrant, and there's about four parcels that are gonna be impacted that we're estimating, is getting onto eastbound Butler. Um, they would have access to a right out to get onto westbound Butler. And from there, they get to northbound or southbound Lone Tree. So it's really the eastbound Butler movement. They would have access off of Lumber, but crossing uh, what we anticipate being pretty heavy volumes on Butler could be difficult. It's providing them a secondary access from Eldon Corridor to Brennan where they could enter Lone Tree and then make that left turn, or even going up to Eldon would be a little bit um, easier to get, to get into the eastbound Butler Avenue. So that's, that's the benefit for that quadrant. For residents west of Lone Tree, it does also support some continuity and access and also helps facilitate some movements onto Lone Tree itself. Instead of having to make an eastbound Butler movement, they could use the, as a local access road, take a right out onto Butler westbound and then access Lone Tree northbound with right turns only instead of having to make a left, bound, a left turn movement onto Butler. So there's a little bit of ease of access for west of Lone Tree residents as well. 
It also provides the community access who don't live in this neighborhood access to improvements in the south side neighborhood, whatever gets developed here. Um, one of the two concepts did have a parking plan, so there would be some access in one of the concepts. Um, but if, if the one without a parking lot is provided, there's not really any access unless we have on-street parking, of people parking in south side neighborhood. Um, and it also does provide um, additional access for parcels if we're gonna get further development down here um, east of um, Eldon Corridor. And I don't know why this isn't working for me. But, uh, the, so the community challenges that we've heard based on feedback is the concern that Eldon Corridor would encourage cut through traffic. <clears throat> so historically right now, traffic does come up Lone Tree and goes on Colorado and cuts over Brennan and then enters and passes through the neighborhood. So that's the current conditions. Providing Eldon Corridor could encourage, especially if we do see backup at the intersection, could encourage people to cut through and do pass through through Eldon and go through the neighborhood, similar to the current conditions they are now. So that is a legitimate concern. We also have potential for truck traffic trying to bypass this intersection and using the same route. So there's a concern that truck traffic may be encouraged to go through the intersection, same way with the opposite direction as well. It provides a bypass that it should have less traffic and may encourage um, users who are local and know the back routes to use that instead of staying on the main roads. So those are the community concerns we've heard back as part of the project. To discourage that, if Eldon were to stay and we want to discourage that, we do have some traffic calming strategies we could integrate as part of the project. Some of these are familiar to, to residents of Flagstaff. We could do dynamic speed display signs. This provides uh, feedback directly on your speed. It does require either solar battery or electrical feed. Um, one of the cons not listed here also is that it's a speed deterrent more than a traffic deterrent. It just slows people down so you don't get the speeders coming through the traffic. Um, one example of this is Butler over near Butler and Fox Glen. There's an example of one of these speed signs. We can also use speed tables and crosswalks. Uh, Southside Plan does have this developing, development, developing into like a park area. So this could encourage uh, drivers to know, hey, this is a pedestrian friendly area. We have people in the park. So we provide speed tables combined with crosswalks like what you see in this top photo here to slow people as they go through this corridor and also highlight that, hey, we have pedestrians crossing here. Uh, I think this would be new to Flagstaff area, but it's something that a lot of other communities use. Um, we could also use curb extensions like you see down here. This example would be, the, there's a lot of these all over downtown. San Francisco and Phoenix has several of these. That's near where this photo was taken. Um, studies have shown that speed tends to speed, s s tends to increase when you get long straight drive um, corridors. So by doing curb extensions, it narrows the roadway, narrows your visual focus, it tends to slow people down. So that's really what's driving um, or the, the thought behind doing the curb extensions. Speed humps, also not typically used in Flagstaff, but I think we're all familiar with what these are, speed bumps, speed humps. Just naturally slows people. People also don't like to drive on them, so it may discourage some of the pass-through traffic. Um, it does have a long-term impact on maintenance on vehicles, though. So it, generally, the trend has been to move away from speed bumps and speed humps just because there is a maintenance component on users of the roadways who have these. Raised median islands, again, uh, common to Flagstaff. This picture is from San Francisco and Elm Avenue. Again, it's a narrowing of the street. It's also a slight deflection angle, so instead of going straight, you have to deflect around the island. Also provides a nice landscaping opportunity um, to, or other artwork or some other um, beautification opportunity for the roadway. And then the opposite of that would be a pinch point where you actually squeeze the roadway in I make it real narrow, so even to the point where you could have alternating traffic would have to really slow down and yield to each other. So those are all opportunities. We could calm traffic. Um, a lot of these would more slow down, but at the same time, if you're slowing people down, they may just stay on the main road because the real benefit of cut through is you can get to your destination faster. So you get the combination of slowing people down and then you discourage the cut through traffic with these. So these would be options we could use if Eldon stays, but we want to discourage and mitigate some of the cut through traffic. Um, and so with that, that's all I have to present. I don't know, there's another slide, sorry. Just means it's not working. Um, so from a design perspective, just to clarify what Eldon impacts. So the biggest impact is drainage design. 
Right now we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers on the Rio de Flag project. We have connections that go into the Rio de Flag project and we're working with them in accelerating our drainage design so we can avoid what's called a 408 permit. Um, if they can incorporate some of our drainage elements, we can avoid several months of obtaining a federal permit. Um, it also requires extensive environmental reviews. And so we're trying to accelerate our drainage design to meet their schedule, which is anticipated to go in at the end of July, early August. Having this road or not having this road is an impact as any type, anytime we put new pavement on the ground, we increase the runoff of the drainage area. Also any grading we do changes existing drainage patterns. And so us knowing whether or not this road stays or goes impacts our drainage design and how we're coordinating with the core. So it's a pretty big impact to our drainage design. Um, roadway design, obviously, if it stays or goes, and how we tie in with driveways. Circulation patterns for parcels that are to remain. Um, some of the access for some of these parcels and how they get in and out. Fire and police access, whether we have to provide turnarounds for fire trucks. Um, those are all being impacted by whether or not this corridor stays. Uh, utility design, right now we're currently in talks with Lumen and APS doing sewer and water. Typically sewer and water stays within the roadway corridor. There are some parcels we're looking at feeding potentially from the north side, which would be off of Eldon. If Eldon goes away, we have to relook at those utilities. Um, so we did get our final design contract back in March and we are proceeding with final design and these are three pretty big elements that we're starting to, to run into a pause until we get a decision on this corridor. So that's why we're here tonight asking for direction and thoughts of where we're headed with it. Um, so where we're, we're leading is we can proceed with Ellen Corridor. Um, we do have some adjustments we'd have to still make. Um, we're still trying to adjust and miss some parcels and try to minimize impacts to parcels. Um, and then we can, if it does stay, we can evaluate traffic calming to try to mitigate some of the concerns the community has expressed, or we can remove Elden Corridor from the project. So, so that's where we'd like to leave uh, the council with. I'm happy to answer any design-related questions or impacts as well. Um, that's the end of our um, presentation this evening on Elden. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple public participants uh, that we'll take before we uh, turn it in for discussion. <coughs> uh, starting with Jesse Sinsabar. Good evening. Some of you know me, the rest of you are lucky. Um, I'm here, I, I, I own one of those, uh, those, those four parcels um, that's, that's east of, of the proposed um, overpass that's gonna lose um, access to, to uh, our current safe access to Butler Avenue, which is um, down Brennan, westbound, and then taking a left onto, onto, um, onto what's gonna be uh, Lone Tree. And, and, and once, we, once we lose that, the, um, the Eldon Corridor becomes pretty critical to us um, as far as getting in and out. Um, and I, so I just urge you to take that into consideration when you're thinking about that, that if this goes to a, uh, you know, strictly walking path, we're going to be pushed. We're going to be, uh, there, there are three businesses on my, on, on my property currently, a towing company, an auto repair company, um, and a landscaping company. And if, if the, if the, um, Eldon corridor doesn't happen, we're going to be pushed into circling through the, the um, the mixed use uh, property on the um, south side of Butler, in order to access our property, um, which isn't super safe, you know. But in addition, um, you know, it makes that property a whole lot, you know, harder to run businesses out of. And my property alone, there, you know, what there between those three businesses. Um, that's uh, 25 uh, jobs that all pay considerably more than min minimum wage um, here in town. So I'd, I'd just like you all to keep that in mind as you're, uh, as you're planning, planning for this. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. That we have uh, one online and you can uh, please tap in. Mayor and Council, I have David Hayward. David, you may address Mayor and Council.
David, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. David, could you please try again? Hi there, I'm trying to do a sound check. I couldn't get through before. Great, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Everyone, hello? Yep, yes. we can hear you. Please proceed. <clears throat> hello, check, check. David, can you hear us? We can hear you. Uh, we can hear you, David. You are w welcome to proceed, if you can hear me. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I apologize for that, guys. Um, uh, this is David Hayward. Um, uh, most of you know me, but I do own about uh, probably about fifty percent of um, the property that was mentioned um, in the presentation. So that's the area between. Um, the overpass in red uh, and the um, Eldon Street extension in green. Um, obviously, Jesse, who just spoke, um, but owns the other part of it. Um, I, the, uh, I was a member of the uh, Southside uh, stakeholder group that helped write the Southside um, community plan. And uh, ever since that happened, say, three years ago, um, I've wondered what um, the purpose of this street is. Um, and quite frankly, it is so that, you know, the people who lease on Jesse's property um, do not have to make a difficult left on Butler. Um, there's no other purpose to it. Um, you know, uh, Jesse's a great guy. And, uh, you know, the, the tenants that work out of there are great people. Um, but we do have to look to the future. Um, this road and this overpass are going to be here for the next generation, uh, not just the folks who lease there right now. Um, and I, I encourage you to ask uh, the consultants, you know, exactly how much are we going to spend on this one road, um, you know, so that, uh, you know, one property owner doesn't have to make a difficult left. It's a, uh, you know, it's as simple as that to me. Um, this just doesn't seem to make sense. Um, I don't really have a dog in the fight. Um, I'm sorry to Jesse that it will, you know, potentially negatively impact his tenants. Um, but I just think that this is a, a waste of the of the city's money, and we could uh, we can we can much better spend this elsewhere on you know priorities for the city and priorities for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I do understand we have one more commenter uh, jumped on as well, so. Mayor and Council, I have Mike Tulis. Mike, you may go ahead and address Mayor and Council. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor and Council members for taking the time to address this. I'm a multi-generational City of Flagstaff member, as is my family. I'd like to commend you on taking the lead for the thoughtful development of this area. And we can see what happens when you don't do anything for the development for a certain area of Flagstaff. It's this area will benefit utilities, streets, sidewalks, street lights, possible basketball courts, bike lanes, trails, access to trails, access to NAU, access to downtown and flag. I think that uh, all these points are in the flyer that the city of Flagstaff generated. I'd like to commend you for taking point on this in this development piece. I uh, appreciate your time. That's all I have. Thank you very much. I'll watch for the rest of your decision. Thank you, Mike. All right, just to confirm that was the last uh, public participant. 
Okay. All right, council. Um, do we have questions, comments regarding this? Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. I'm wondering if we did any outreach to the South Side community, um, particularly with the Elden Corridor. Um, we had a public meeting back in, I want to say September, October of last year, and we provided uh, multiple, or we received multiple comments uh, with concerns about mobility uh, through this corridor. Um, we did have multiple concerns about how people would get around this area. No direct feedback if people were in favor or against the Elden Corridor, though. There was no comments that I remember receiving that were in favor of it going away or staying. Thank you. Councilmember Esslin. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief here at the start uh, just to kick things off uh, and to sort of telegraph where I'm thinking on this. Jesse, I really appreciate you being here. I really do. Uh, I thank you for uh, weighing in, for participating, and for your advocacy for the interests that you represent. Um, I do have to say, pretty point blank though, I agree with Mr. Hayward on this. Um, I'm not sure that the, the Eldon Corridor Road is uh, justifiable uh, for the taxpayer. And also, it's unfortunate that we can't, it seems like what I'm hearing is we can't have both the park amenities and the corridor in that space. And I, uh, I need to prioritize the park amenities. Uh, it's long overdue for this community in that region. Um, and I think those, those elements are very important. Uh, and also, I, I just, uh, this is an aside, uh, so I'm kind of switching gears here real quickly, but, um, and I believe this has come up in some of our beautification discussions before, uh, but you showed that, that virtual video, which I just loved. I wish we had something like that for every angle on every capital project we're doing. Um, makes me feel like I'm playing an Xbox game. Uh, it's, a, it's very immersive and very nice uh, tool for us to have for visualization. And I noticed the, the space, it looked like it could be, uh, become a giant mural or art project for the city. Uh, and I'm looking forward to those conversations, just as an aside for how to, uh, whether, whether we move forward as a council on the corridor or not, um, how, to, how, how we're going to have fun with that space. I'll leave my comments there for now. I look forward to the discussion we ha we're having up here. Thank you, Councilmember Aslan. Councilman McCarthy. Well, I'll just point out that we've talked about two options. One is proceed with Eldon Corridor. The other is remove Eldon Corridor. Well, there's a third option, which would be put a footpath in there. In other words, bicycle and pedestrian path, which would be far less impact uh, than a road. And um, it would it would uh, promote pedestrian and bicycle traffic without um, the problems and associated with putting a new road in there. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. Councilmember House. I just wanted to circle back to some of the uh, gentrification impact conversation because what's confusing me at this point is the uh, basically the assessment under that uh, section that said that there was low impact. Um, when in my reading of that presentation, there were four out of six areas contributing to potentially to the gentrification of that neighborhood. Um, and then in looking at this Eldon Corridor impact, two of those are, are heightened um, by that. It's the, the potential of the pass-through traffic and um, some of the industrialization of the area with, with the potential of trucks running through that residential area. Um, so was that gentrification study done considering the Eldon Corridor or was that done separate from this? The gentrification included the concept that you're seeing on the screen, which included Elden Corridor. <clears throat> um, generally, when we look at a project like Lone Tree, we look at it as a network level. So generally, when we do an arterial road, we, we feel people are going to stay on the arterial roads. 
Um, to use Elgin Corridor as a cut through traffic, the people who are going to be using those types of roads are going to be your local users. They're not going to be your weekend users, your tourists, um, your commercial from out of state, out of city. Um, they're not going to know to use this road as a cut through traffic. So that's where we said, I believe on the cut through, it was a may reduce. It was, it's one of those hards. Local users are, may know this route. They may know to cut through. Non-local users are going to stick to the artillery roads. They have a nice uh, grade separated <coughs> uh, crossing with Lone Tree Road over BNSF. The cut through traffic would be going to San Francisco or Beaver, and there's a grade at grade crossing with BNSF where you're potentially stopped at BNSF. So that's where we said it's sort of a mixed use with the cut through traffic. It's, we think there's gonna be an overall reduction because right now the current encouragement is coming north on Lone Tree, up Colorado, and you go right over Brennan and there's a natural movement. This project cuts that off, but now by introducing this corridor, local users will still know about it and you still might have some. So it's not a complete elimination of cut through traffic, it's just a modification with local users if that makes sense. Hopefully I clarified that. Yeah, it does, thank you. Um, I think still overall, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with some of the, I, I guess the confusion that's, that's, that exists around the presentation of the Eldon Loop Road connection um, because it's, it's been presented as, as part of um, that um, uh, Prop 420 um, yet in reading through it, there's not specific reference to it, correct? It's, it's, it's talking about the road connections is what's referenced there. Am I correct? Mayor Council, yeah, it, it has one sentence in the pamphlet language that says that uh, road connections underneath the overpass will be completed. It does not say Eldon Loop Road, but this is the only road um, that really fits that, that, that description. So you're correct. All right, thank you, council member. <clears throat> Waiting for Shimoni to pop on here, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm ready. You ready? You, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, pra I'm practicing sitting back more. I'm, I'm trying mayor and council and staff. <laughs> uh, mayor, you may you want me to jump in. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. I have a couple questions as well, but okay. uh, go right ahead. You know, Mayor, I don't have much. Um, Jason and, and Christine, again, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm just, you know, enjoying the conversation we're having and, and just listening to my colleagues speak and bring up their points. I I like to see us prioritize bike pad here. Um, I like the South, the South Side's plan, especially the one with the basketball courts. Um, that excites me. And, and you know, when, when we were talking about the, the pros and cons here in the trade-offs, you know, it makes me think about my many conversations with Martin, which will, he'll say things like who's benefiting and, and who's giving something up. And it's just, it's always a trade-off game and you can never please everybody. And I do feel for those, those businesses and, and that employer and those employees, but I believe the South side neighborhood uh, would greatly benefit from this this corridor being a, a foots and a bike pad with the park and and that excites me and it just I'm just excited that it sounds like council's heading in that direction as well so I'll just add that and I appreciate everyone's efforts here thank you thank you council member Shimoni um, I had a couple questions one council member house touched on which was the information pamphlet because I was trying to read it through completely I was <laughs> I only found that one little bit um, so I also had a question what is the cost of this corridor if we build it because we are over budget with this project as it stands now yeah so we, I we haven't fully developed this cost um, tried to text my roadway lead and uh, Contractor Chris, I don't know if you're still online or if you have that broken out as a, as a specific cost. I don't see his initial. I don't. Here. Jason, yeah, I don't believe we've evaluated that as a specific cost yet, just because we were looking at developing this uh, versus a foot trail versus a roadway and what they wanted on the roadway and stuff. But we could easily put something together. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we could quickly uh, develop something if that information is needed, but it, because we haven't developed it fully, I don't know if we have a fully broken out cost for this specific section of roadway. Okay. Thank you. Because uh, that, that is one consideration if we are, this is a large project and a lot of money, and we are yeah. already very heavily over. Uh, so I think that is a, a strong consideration of mine as we have this discussion. Um, others, Councilman McCarthy. Uh, I want to address the uh, comment that in the, the brochure, it said that there would be an under road under there. And I read that. Um, yeah, it's there. However, um, it's just sort of like as an aside. It's not the focus of this project by any means in my mind. So I think, well, I think we're, I could go into all kinds of scenarios. I'm thinking if you were in such and such a place, how would you get to such and such another place? Without getting into that, I think I'm leaning towards putting in a foots trail uh, and not putting in a road. So pedestrians, bicycles, yes, but uh, a road, no. And, you know, the cut through traffic is uh, a real concern. And, uh, you know, trucks going through there, a lot of traffic going through there. You know, I'm the liaison to the traffic commission and, and we just like almost every month hear a discussion about how do we get rid of this cut through traffic? In La Plaza Vieja, we're doing all kinds of things to stop uh, cut through traffic. So here's an example of where we can save money uh, have a, a really good path for pedestrians and, and bicycles and get rid of some cut-through traffic. And I admit that there are a little difficulty getting out of uh, these parcels on the east side of the new bridge. And But I, in my mind, kind of thought, okay, you could do it in certain ways. It isn't like we're going to be completely cutting them off by any means. Anyway, that's kind of where I'm leaning. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. Thank you. Councilmember Salas? Um, I have a few comments, uh, but I'll start with a question. Um, can you please uh, rewind to corridor history, about the Elden Corridor history? Okay, so, you know, these three bullet points just, just illustrate how the quote unquote Elden Corridor has evolved. In 2010, it started as a roadway only, no sidewalk. And then it was somehow integrated into Prop 420 language road, roadway with Flagstaff Urban Trail System trail on north side not part of Prop 20, but developed during schematic design. Then of course, more recently, it's the Southside Community Plan where it says local paths only. Can you expound on the phrase local paths only? Does it, does it include vehicle or does it focus on pedestrian and um, bicyclists? Um, and of course, I, I remember when council uh, uh, deliberated on and approved a Southside community plan where uh, it showed uh, a, civic, a civic space and potential um, pocket park neighbor slash neighborhood park slash uh, basketball court and potential place for gathering and marketplace. So please explain the local paths only, as indicated in that screen. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back to, so this shows the, um, sorry, the, the keyboard's not working. Um, but um, this shows the concepts pulled from the Southside Community Plan. These are showing a trail system. Um, I don't recall specifically from this plan if these are defined as foot trails, uh, sidewalk pass, or DG pass. Um, to be honest with you, I don't remember offhand right now. But they are not intended to be vehicular pass. They are meant to be for for pedestrians. They might be paved for bicyclists as well. I'd have to go back to the plan and look for that. 
Um, so this is the first exhibit. You see they have a connection from uh, Brennan and then over to uh, Lumber and then the next, well, they did have a parking lot and then they had an east-west connection mainly and then a, at Brennan, um, so a multi-circle route like you would see a normal park system. So these were not intended for vehicles, maybe for maintenance vehicles, but not for um, vehicular access for local residents. Thank you so much for that response. Um, <clears throat> I am leaning toward uh, developing this area as reflected on Southside Community Plan. So, promoting uh, pedestrian walkability, accessibility through uh, uh, bicycling and walking and also developing that space for uh, uh, civic, civic space, uh, potential recreation area, uh, place of gathering and uh, public art. Um, I am very mindful of the cost, Mr. Mayor. As we all know, most of construction projects now have, have doubled and will be tripled in the next year. Due to you, due to many many variables such as supply chain and uh, workforce uh, shortage, um, though I am actively involved in bringing in at least 2.6 million to this project with my role with Rural Transportation Advocacy Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Salas. Councilmember McCarthy. It, we have spent a lot of time talking about uh, traffic safety at uh, Lone Tree and Butler for bicycles and pedestrians. So if we do add a uh, bicycle pedestrian path underneath the bridge, that'll be a lot of people could, you know, bicyclists and pedestrians could avoid that intersection completely and have an extremely safe route underneath the bridge. So that's another reason that I'm leaning the way I am. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. Well, I will just say it does sound like we have direction now already um, for no road. Uh, do you want to jump yeah, in here, Ms. Campbell? I just, I, I kind of wanted to paint the picture going forward with what we're hearing. Um, we still need to make sure that these parcels are served by utilities. And so this road was going to serve as a utility corridor. We're gonna to have to do work and see how else we can get utilities to these parcels. It, it may look like um, the same type of alignment as the roadway, but instead of the roadway, we put utilities and we put a foots path instead. Um, the, the one thing, <laughs> we don't really have plans or funding for the future civic space. That foots, if we put it in with our project, is basically gonna go nowhere um, and, and kind of empty out onto Butler I mean, there's, I know that this is a concern probably from, um, from Jeff and, and Martin Entz. Um, not saying that we can't do, um, you know, what you're directing us to do, but the, the benefits and, and what you'll see was probably maybe a longer term type of game. So I did, I did wanna kind of mention mm -hmm. that, the, the timing on it. Thank you, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, Councilman McCarthy. So um, I presume that if we, put in a foot's path, that it could basically be the whole length of this green line that's on the, not this chart, but the other chart. Um, and I understand utilities could be problematic to some point. Yes, that chart. I'm assuming that we could build a foot's path um, that goes the full length of that green line or something similar to that. It wouldn't have to be the same as that. But in other words, it would connect all the way through. Is that true? And it, my point is that would be way cheaper than building a road. So the, the foots concept through this area is that they, um, there's a foots that's gonna hug the south side of the Rio, going all the way to where it crosses at the Butler Tunnel. Um, this is a long-term planning for them. Um, it doesn't necessarily take that bend to the south and pop right out onto Butler. It, it goes further, uh, further to the east along the Rio de Flag. Um, okay. okay, but there would be some way for a pedestrian or a bicyclist to get through. They might have to jog a couple streets left or right or something 
but they could get through. It wouldn't be dead ended, would it? Right. When they, um, I think it would serve westbound foot traffic better than eastbound foot traffic because if you're going westbound on Butler and you're on a bike or on foot, you're on a sidewalk or you're on the bike lane, uh, you can hit this and get off of Butler and, and go into the cottage in Eldon, that dog leg there. If you're coming to the east, then you know you're on you're on the foots, and then you hit you hit Butler, and so to go further east, you're going to have to cross the street to get into the appropriate bike lane if you're a bicycle, or you're going to just ride your bike on the sidewalk. I mean that that area of Butler is not really conducive to, to crossing, um, but until you get to like Sawmill. Councilmember Shimoni. Thank you, Mayor and, and Christine. Really good, interesting points you're making. I really appreciate that level of detail here and concern for the, the movement of cyclists. And Councilmember McCarthy, I, I appreciate your, your creativity and your thought here. I, I think you bring up some interesting points, but it's a little bit more complicated, as Christine's saying, too. Um, Christine, quick question. So, you know, I know something that engineers do with projects is, I, I forget the correct terminology, but it's some kind of cost benefit where they weigh out different, you know, costs and different benefits and different goals. And I guess my question is, you know, assuming, let's say council wanted to pursue a road here. I have no idea what that might cost. I would, I would hate to even guess, but let's just say it's a couple million dollars. I, I have no idea. But, um, and if we said, okay, you know, never mind, we don't want to do a road. Let's do, do the foots. Let's just say we had 1.2 million extra at the end of the day, or whatever that balance might be from that road savings. Is there not a way to utilize those funds for the uh, a park? Councilmember Shimoni, I, I would think that those funds would go into the overage that we're seeing on the construction escalation for the overall project. There, there wasn't any park or civic space contemplated in the bond. And I think that's where we would get caught. Okay, I see. That's interesting. Okay, bummer. I guess we'll have to keep thinking creative, creatively about how to fund this park, but I'd love to see that through. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Shimoni. Um, with that, I don't hear direction fully for a foot specifically right away with this project. I am hearing that we are that we do not want to make it a road. That's what I'm hearing, just to help clarify and give direction. Councilmember McCarthy. So it sounds like we've decided not to have a road. Have we decided to not have a pedestrian path, call it foots or call it sidewalk or something? A decision for later. Is that a decision for later? I, I think we'll, we'll take a look at where the utilities need to go first. And you know, I would hate to plan a, a foots path and then construct it and not knowing what the civic space is, where, what Southside wants. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a little bit of the chicken and the egg here. Yeah. But I think the utilities is the most important part, you know, to move forward with. Well, I agree that you're going to have to move forward with the utilities first. But, I mean, if there were a civic space down there, it would seem that you could have a pedestrian path through there. Maybe it's not a foot trail. Maybe it's just a sidewalk. But a way that people could walk under the bridge and get over into that neighborhood in the west and migrate through the streets and hit San Francisco Street at some point. I, I mean, I think it would be crazy to to build this in a way that there was no pedestrian path under the bridge, civil uh, civic space or no civic space. Well, that's going to be the decision we can look at a later time. I mean, this is really for designs that they need to put together for July, you were saying, something to that effect. So I think this is enough uh, direction now from council, and I would personally like to learn a little bit more and talk to uh, Martin Ince potentially on how this fits into our larger framework of a, our ATMP um, for this particular area, or there may be other areas that we need to prioritize for that ex type of expenditure. So I'm not feeling comfortable moving forward with the foots aspect of this, but uh, I think we have we are uh, have an agreement regarding not putting a road right there. Mr. Mayor, technically the way it's posted, it was just about the Elden Loop connection. It wasn't about whether or not there should or shouldn't be a foot, so you're spot on as far as moving forward and discussing that later. Thank you, Sterling. All right, uh, Councilman McCarthy. Key words, we will discuss it later. 
<laughs> we'll put one foot in front of the other. Okay. Did you have any <laughs> one foot. Oh, and the dad <laughs> jokes come out. <laughs> I just had one more, uh, I guess, notification for council and the public. We will be back before you on uh, June 7th to talk about the Butler and Lone Tree intersection and those alternative designs. And we also are planning that public meeting for probably the third week in July. And we haven't landed on a date yet, but um, we'll be covering the economic impact study. We'll be covering the public art and beautification. Um, and we'll be covering the update on the intersection design in, in that public meeting. So. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. Well, thank you for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Thank you.